Hello and welcome to the Full Scottish on Broadcast in Scotland. My name's Corrie Wilson and I'm joined this morning by Martin Doherty Hughes, the MP for Western Bartonshire, and Ellen Hoffer, who's from the European Citizens for an Independent Scotland. Welcome to you both. Nice to see you, Corrie. Hello. You too. We've got much to talk about as usual um, in the, the programme and of course top of the list is Brexit. No. You'd, be, you'd be surprised <laughs> if it wasn't. And obviously, yet again this week, um, we're, we're reaching a pivotal point in Westminster. Um, will Theresa May get her deal through will be the biggest question. If not, um, Ellen, what do you think, where does this leave the EU nationals? Well, either way, if Theresa May's deal goes through, we get terrible treatment from the Tories and from the Home Office. And if it doesn't go through, we get complete uncertainty and bad treatment from the Tories and the Home Office. So either way... Uh, there is no real certainty for us at this point. The provisions that have been made are provisions that can be thrown overboard at any given point, and they do, they do it frequently. There's plenty of examples where they've been going all along, oh, we're, we're not going to include this criteria in settled status, and it's just gotten thrown back in. There is no certainty for us at the minute, for us in Scotland at least. The only certainty would be independence. Mm. In terms of, um, obviously, there, there's a whole load of um, areas that are going to be affected, Martin, and things mm -hmm. like implications on the ports about how can that continue to function. The Road Haulage Association said the government are in denial um, and they, they estimated that it would take 170 people eight hours to process one trailer or one lorry. Um, and obviously we saw Kent Council um, already talking about um, that it, they, they've warned that there's going to be chaos um, and that no deal could cost, the gridlock could cost us 1.75 billion a week um, to the economy. Um, and we had this scenario the other week there where the lorry drivers were paid 500 mm -hmm. euros, I think it was, to test drive the system. Um, what do you think? Um, to say, I actually think they're being duplicitous. I mean, look at the select committee that Joanna Cherry uh, mm -hmm. is on in terms of Joanna forensically tore apart the minister about their contingency planning for a no deal um, and this emergency piece of uh, contractual work given for ferries to a company that don't own ferries. Uh, and, and I think Joanna's argument blew apart the idea that they have not been working on this. So rather than not having a clue about what they're doing, what, from my perspective, they are duplicitous they are hiding the truth, and it is an unmitigated disaster. There's obviously another um, sector um, that's going to be affected is farming, um, and they are, they are thought to be one of the most vulnerable businesses because obviously there's the, the seasonal um, European workers that are coming in, but obviously perishable food exports as well, and apparently abattoirs are facing a big shortage of vets because right now 95% of vets are currently EU nationals? It, it, it's a disaster that's about to happen. Uh, and then Tuesday night when I go through the lobbies, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, to vote against the deal. Um, there is, you know, you know, this is not a, a joke. It's not something which, you know, it, 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 you know it's just, you know, appeared. Uh, and people are in, I think, for a very rude awakening when Brexit does happen. And there is a bit of delusion, I think, in uh, London. Uh, again, with these kind of Norway plus plus plus, or as I called it, the Norway plus plus stroke TK Max version, uh, the other week uh, in the debate, the first element, the first section of the Brexit debate. Uh, and you know, the EEA are going to be quite clear; they don't want the UK in the EEA, this huge country. Um, and being in the EEA won't get around all the implications for getting out into the rest of the European Union. If you're going to Switzerland in a truck, you still need to queue, you still need to go in, you still need to get all your documentation signed off. So the bureaucracy will be automatic. You know, it, it is just creating a situation which will be untenable for farmers, for the fishing industry, especially the inshore fishing industry. You know, the, the big people in the kind of uh, extraterritorial waters um, have been, you know, saying how it might be great for them, but for the inshore fishery industry, which is some of the bedrock of fishing mm -hmm. in Scotland, it's going to be an absolute catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And obviously an, another key thing will be transport and, and travel, Ellen, and um, you know they're, they're, they're talking about extra expenses and delays and, and not automatically getting a, you know admitted to another country. 
What's your thoughts on the it's been possible implications? surprising to see that people would vote out of a system that works and makes exactly these things easier and then get absolutely outraged about the mm. fact that now there's charges and time mm. attached. It really is one of the very glaring examples of there being complete and utter misunderstanding about what the EU has meant to the lives of people here and what has made it so easy and obviously yes EU citizens in the UK are scared and scared for for good reasons but there's a, a lot of British people that are living in Europe that have to deal with the same uncertainties but in another place all of it could have been removed. Yeah I, I would just fall in terms of uh, EU nationals and I think the other thing that I, and I've as you know Corey I've been on about it for quite some time is the impact of Brexit on the Good Friday Agreement and EU nationals who also happen to be Irish nationals. Mm -hmm. And there are some cases at the moment where it's quite clear where Minister of State Caroline Noakes has made it quite clear that other international treaties will um, oh, you know, basically undermine fundamentally the Good Friday Agreement, mm -hmm. where an Irish national who lives in Northern Ireland, comes from Northern Ireland, identifies as Irish, has Irish citizenship if their partner comes from another EU country or non-EU, uh, non-Britain, non, uh, some anywhere else in the world, they will be forced to take up British citizenship, and that fundamentally is a, a detriment to the idea of you can be British, Irish, or both uh, within um, in Northern Ireland. So that, that should be a real, real huge worry for everybody mm -hmm. in terms of undermining the Good Friday Agreement and the fact that uh, the Conservative Party really want to sacrifice it to keep the DUP on board, it, it, it should be worrying and send alarming, alarm bells off everywhere. And what's your thoughts, Martin, on the, this, the position of the DUP at the moment? Are they going to be supporting the government or...? I, I, I don't know, it's really strange and this can make, seem a bit weird to folk listening that I actually get on with the DUP and that might be really strange because not only have I come from a really Irish uh, you know, background in terms of you know the family were traditionally Republican or nationalist. Um, I am I'm I'm an openly gay man. Um, one of the DUP members even sent me a wedding card when we get married. <laughs> um, so you know the complexity of the DUP is uh, uh, if you get scratch under the skin, it's a very complex political party, and I think you need to be clear that you know the, the DUP are going to get as much out of this as possible, and if they w we will not do is they will not undermine the government in terms of a vote of confidence. And the fact that Jeremy Corbyn, the British Labour Party, and I think people should be very aware of this, that there was evidence that he and Macdonald were actually behind the scenes talking to the DUP. And the fact that the British Labour Party would rather talk to the DUP than the Scottish National Party, then we're all in trouble. Mm. But I don't uh, think the DUP will undermine uh, a Conservative government. The Prime Minister is a different ballgame altogether, uh, but not a Conservative mm. government. No, the DUP is acting as a sort of in coalition opposition, yeah. but they have no, I don't think the end game for the DUP, they, they have no defined line on their end game. They're just distra distracting and disturbing what is yeah. going on to play the muscles that they have yeah. to play with. And obviously, um, last Tuesday, not one single Tory MP voted to rule out a new deal. Um, given that Scotland voted to stay in the EU, are they really representing their constituents? Um, <coughs> it would be easy for me to say that I'm representing my constituents because my constituents voted to remain within the United Kingdom. And I, I'm not going to um, try to figure out uh, uh, some of these real right-wing Conservative members uh, who you know, are quite happy with a no deal. Uh, I, I really can't explain it. I think there's an element of um, delusion. I think there's an element of that uh, Britain is still some type of major world power. And, you know, because it sits at the UN, the Security Council, because it has nuclear weapons. Um, and, and most people in the rest of the world at the UN are just sitting back agog. You know, they, they're like, you know, I'm a member of the Defence Select Committee. And you know, was uh, I very rarely, rarely do trips abroad. And once I had to go to Washington, and it was the strangest event ever. And you clearly saw that the UK was now being sidelined, and basically, being, or either being told what to do. And the new big pal in the room was France. So, as in terms of a global power, in terms of a no deal, in terms of going for WTO rules, they're utterly delusional. And that's at every element of um, international engagement. What's your thoughts on the possibility of a general election, Ellen? Well, um, I'm kind of dreading it. 
it would be an opportunity for Scotland to have a sort of democratic say again and would potentially reaffirm what is happening in Scotland. But for the UK, a general election offers no hope and no alternative. There is not much between the Tories and Labour, especially as long as Labour is refusing to go into active opposition to what is going on. And they're not everything that has happened in the last two and a half years should have led to Labour taking a stance and taking the opportunity to represent the other half of the country that didn't vote for Brexit. Mm -hmm. uh, and they haven't and they won't. Do you think that's what Jeremy's going to push for? Uh, if you don't be happy with a general election, you know, I challenged uh, the British Labour Party in the floor of the Commons the other week in the first section of the Brexit debate and told them to you know, get their finger out and get on with it and table the mo motion and no confidence. At the end of the day, they're not going to win it. Mm. And that's just the arithmetic because the DUP will not uh, undermine a Conservative government. And I think, you know, they're, 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 they forget what the Conservative Party's name is, the Conservative and Unionist Party. And this is more than just about Brexit. It's more than just about the traditional sense of politics and what, you know, that type of political agenda and that type of unionism actually means for those in the DUP. So Corbyn maybe should go to Northern Ireland on a more regular basis and go and see what the DUP really represent. Uh, you know, they're an MP who believes that the earth is flat. You know, it's just extraordinary, you know. So I don't see them supporting that in any shape or form. Happy if it happens, we'll vote for it. And uh, But at the end of the day, I think we'll probably see the Prime Minister go before we see a general election. Mm. And obviously, um, I think... Bear just to say also, yeah. you know, I think it's also important for folk to realise that a lot of Labour MPs don't want a general election. Mm. You know, they, they don't want um, Corbyn as far as... Because they're the complete right-wingers in the Labour Party. Uh, and I can understand the uh, concern that some people, Labour members, get about right-wing Labour MPs, and there are quite a lot of them, yeah. you know, so you know they're caught between a rock and a hard place. You um, talked about um, tradition earlier on there, and, and I think um, in terms of Berko's position, he's mm. he's kind of struggled quite a bit recently, hasn't he, in terms of the processes and, and what, because obviously the Westminster Parliament set up that this is how you do things and this is how we've always done things, and the balls seem to be in the air now. Yeah. And he's kind of... I think it's really interesting because, again, some folk were saying uh, during the week because Bercow was... the decisions he took within the chamber after PMQs were all the points of order. And it was the night before, uh, just to give you a wee idea of this, that Dominic Grieve was in looking um, in one of the, the... what they call the tea room, and he was looking for signatures to his amendment. And, of course, he, a couple of our members signed it. And uh, he was going about, you know, you know, at least we get on the order paper. And he was talking about, you know, the procedure and, you know, and, uh, and, and the process. And I, and, I, and I laughed out loud at the table and I said, what are you talking about? There is no procedure. There is no process. There is precedent. And, and, I, and, and I, I get a wee bit concerned that people don't think what Berkow's done is not right. Because it is the Speaker is the most powerful person in the Commons. Mm -hmm. And they can set precedent. So whether or not you agree with that precedent or not is irrelevant. That means the precedent has been set for future speakers. I know he's probably going to go at some point during the year, so you know, in the end of days, thinking, you know what, I'm going to kind of mix it up a wee bit and see what happens here. But he was right in terms of um, the British concept of parliamentary sovereignty um, and making sure that Parliament has a full voice in it because he recognises that Parliament is profoundly divided on it, mm. and he is his job as speaker to make sure that the voice is articulated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was a wee bit kind of. I wonder why people are getting hit up about it, as I say, because there is no process. It's all about precedent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, what do you think? What can we expect to see when you go back down this week? Um, yeah, Brexit. It's going to be. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the government will be defeated. It'll be interesting to see what the majority against the government will be. Mm. Uh, I think if it's a quite a huge majority, it leaves uh, the prime minister in a kind of sticky wicket. But at the end of the day, I don't think we'll see the government fall. Um, I think they'll come back at some point. Uh, there's going to be no change in terms of negotiations. The EU uh, uh, member states have made it quite clear there's no room for negotiation, you know, and, uh, and that's every member, whether it be Ireland, Malta, Lithuania, France, um, Romania, you know, they're all saying this is it, this is as good as it gets. And then that's not only just to the Conservative Party and the government, but also to the Labour Party. If you get an idea that you're going to come back for anything new, which is going to make this more palatable, Forget it. There is, there is no palatable way of leaving the European mm. Union.
No, but they have made really significant strides, I think, in, in offering a hand of friendship. Yeah. This letter that was sent by members of 26 of the 27 nations that t to make sure that the UK knows you can roll back on this, you mm. can cancel this. This is a concession, it's just not maybe the concession that the UK had wanted, yeah. but we have wasted a, an awful lot of time mm. not negotiating and sticking to red lines that have boxed the UK into a corner. That was not the EU. Yeah. And I think that's been made very clear and highlighted by SNP MPs down in Westminster, especially in the last two weeks. I mean, we've been clear, you know, since day one about access to the single market and the customs union. If we were remaining within the union, um, Scotland's majority in terms of the MPs and the Commons have articulated this position. Uh, that has been supported to agree, I think, with the Liberals. Um, Labour is fundamentally divided on it. Um, and uh, the Tories are just towing the party line. Uh, but we in the SNP have been clear, consistent that we want to remain within the single market and the customs union if we are to remain within the United Kingdom and if not, as you know, the First Minister has been clear that the opportunity for a new independent referendum uh, will be uh, on the table. And sticking with Westminster, obviously we saw some ugly scenes recently with the so-called yellow vest protesters um, and some MPs re receiving verbal abuse um, and in some cases alleged physical abuse spitting. Um, is there a difference between protesting and abuse? Oh yeah, I mean, if you can't have a coherent argument with someone, uh, whether it be politics or anything else, then, you know, if it is intimidating, if there's a power relationship in which one element of it is more powerful than the other, mm. then, yeah, yeah, then it's abuse. And um, I am, if, you know, I thought, I, I, I'm not uh, you know, agreeing with Anna Sudbury's politics in any shape or form, but if I were her, I know what I would have done, but again, I would have probably ended up in jail. Um, and, um, so you know the fascism. You call them the yellow, you know, the yellow vests, so kind of um, on a yellow summit, you know, to kind of undervalue them. So uh, they're fascists. Mm -hmm. They are fascists, and we know that in this this moment there is a vacuum, especially in England, um, especially in the far south, around um, the, the far right wing, and it will spread unless it is uh, challenged. Uh, and I'm not just talking about in parliaments, I'm talking about in, as a member of the Scottish National Party in our local branches. Uh, it's got to be challenged in, in schools, it's got to be challenged in our families. You know, we don't sit mm -hmm. idly, idly by, uh, you know, uh, coming from a place like Clybank, I know what fascism can lead to, and it's utter destruction. Yeah. And you're picking up on that point, do you think this kind of behaviour um, is a threat to democracy? The whole, I think the whole Brexit process has really undermined our concept of what um, what a liberal democracy is, and it's challenged people to start thinking about being engaged far more. I mean, um, I remember, you know, how people say we're disengaged, and, and I think that's to a point. It's right because, you know, how difficult is it for somebody who's got two mobile phones, three iPads, and ten computers in the house not to go to a tenants' residence meeting on a Wednesday night, or to a community council mm -hmm. on a Thursday? You know, and that's where democracy starts to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're so busy on your phone playing with Twitter and social media, and we all think it's great sometimes, what you're doing is you're disengaging from the reality of lived politics. And that is, yeah, it's about making sure your, your stanks are clean, you know, that you know the street lights are on, that you're engaging with your local authority councillors through their political mandate. Um, and these are the very basics, and, and I think we're in a wee bit of trouble at the moment in terms of understanding what liberal democracy is about. It's not all about Parliament. It's not all about MSPs or MPs or MEPs or Prime Ministers. It's about us as political individuals in our communities participating with one another. Well, and democracy also needs to be about catching up with the times. If this is the way that people engage with the world outside them, then our politics need to be reflective of that. And in order to have a proper democratic representation, we need to use the paths that we have. It's a, mm. it's a part of design, a part of product design and service design, yeah. how we go about that. Um, I think it's important to remember that people are trying to be engaged, uh, just that the level of education that is behind their engagement mm. is incredibly poor and there is not a proper outlet for that yet. I think it's, it, it's a difficult one because um, the National uh, was running some big articles today on industries of the future. and. Um, for my sins, I'm the SNP spokesperson on industries of the future and blockchain. Uh, my team, Bank Clyde Bank, will be elated to hear talking about blockchain. And 
there's a lot of people who say that blockchain will make it, for instance, a lot easier for us to vote. It'll be more secure, more trustworthy, and these types of innovative approaches. The big if on that is it's not about the tech in that sense, because the tech is great. It's about giving a person a reason to vote. Why do you want to vote? Why, you know, whether it be on a, a mobile app, whether it be at the ballot box, what is physically moving you to go and cast a ballot, whether it be paper or digital? And that's the big question that no one really is, I think, tackling at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that nobody is, but we, we don't need to talk about technology as the only mm. way. I think there's other things that we can do. And I think yeah. this, there are people, especially out in Scotland, that are after this. Citizen assemblies are, yeah. are one of the ways in which we can do this and where people stop feeling that their vote is an obligation that they don't really want to engage with. There is more to being part of a society and part of being part of democracy than just casting your vote once. You Very should be part so. in shaping yeah. what is happening. And that's why I would always say to people, you know, community councils have been around for a long, long time mm -hmm. and they are they have their own mandate, non political, but they have their mandate. It's in the legislation and you know, you know, they have you know certain rights and you know it's a structure which goes back into our communities and it exists and you know, I'm sometimes worried that we start to reinvent the wheel when it comes to engagement and participation when we have community councils all over the country. And you know, it's about how you engage them, how do you make sure that people are, see them of value and of worth. And also about building the skills. I mean, does anyone know how to be a secretary? Does anybody fill, know how to fill out a treasurer's account? You know, these are the fundamental building blocks of running an organi you know, any you know, voluntary uh, organisation, whether it be a community council or, or a friendship group. You, you touched on earlier, uh, Martin, about the um, ferry contract. Yeah. Um, now that scenario rumbles on, um, and obviously, it just seems ludicrous that an organisation would be awarded a contract and they don't have any boats. Do you almost? It almost feels like the government are so arrogant that they think they can just award contracts to whoever without due diligence, really, yeah. um, and have no accountability. I think if anyone really wants to see it again, is go on social media and find Joanna's, Joanna Cherry's mm. um, forensic destruction of the minister. And it doesn't surprise me in any shape or form that the government have done this. Uh, excuse me, they've, they've been planning this now, as that's why I say they're duplicitous in, mm. in hiding the facts that they are planning for a no deal. And that's not to say there won't be a deal, but you know, it, it should be of no surprise to anybody that this is a government fundamentally, um, you know, running around like a headless chicken. And it is trying to find opportunities anywhere. Quick wins. If that means giving a contract to do ferries to a company that doesn't have a single ferry, you know, it, it, it's extraordinary. You it know. does surprise me, the mindset though. It's not just the government awarding this contract, mm. but also the the this company using did you see that about the taking something from a from fast food menu mm -hmm. or from a yeah. takeaway menu the the lack of due diligence in that entire system mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. is astounding no wonder that the international community is really waking up to the uk being nowhere near the respected democracy that everybody yeah. liked to thought to think it was i mean i i spoke to a, a senior diplomat invasion of earth thinking would have as i used to say you know it'd be kind of really weird you know and this senior diplomat saying, we now see the UK, and I mean senior in, in terms of a close ally with the UK, saying that this is now a semi-failed state. Hmm. And that's how it is being viewed by large liberal democracies across the West. Hmm. But it's not often we can say that there's good news come from Westminster, but there was this week for Alison Thulis, an MP, yeah. who had um, been campaigning for the U-turn the on the two-child benefit cap, um, and obviously that has they have done a U-turn in that, which is welcome, I assume. Yeah, no, mm. definitely. Uh, it's just to, how we got to that point is extraordinary. Mm. And the work that Alison's done is just uh, fantastic. You know, she's a, some fighter, some campaigner, and, and really got on with this and challenged uh, the UK government at every corner on it. So, yeah, uh, profoundly welcome, not just in my constituency, but across mm. the whole of the UK. And would you like to see that? Totally halted, um, Ellen. Obviously, Absolutely. it's just for the, the the period from April. But do you feel it should just Absolutely. be Absolutely, and it's not just that about universal credit. I think there can be very little doubt. All of it is a terrible way of treating human beings, and it's absolutely <laughs> not helping anybody. No. It's making things worse for everybody, and will cost more than it will ever save anybody in money. It costs human lives. Yeah. Leaving Westminster behind for Yay. a wee while. Um, 
We'll, we'll look at the, the film uh, I, Daniel Blake, who, that was shown in TV this week um, and caused a, a wave of social media reaction. Some were appalled, some were upset, um, but Tory supporters were mainly defending it as a story. Um, what are your thoughts on the reaction to this type of document, not documentary, but drama? If yeah, you like? I, I mean, I have got, you know, it's like, it's like saying hard times, you know, it, it was not reflective of the period. And, you know, it's Roach that did the movie, isn't it? And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, like Dickens, you know, what they're doing is reflecting the lived experience of people around them. And, you know, the old Tories and the Whigs um, back in Dickens' day were the exact same. And, you know, and it wasn't social media they used to have a go. And it was, you know, it was pamphlets and things like that, you know. So, uh, you know, it's social commentary that really kind of gets at you to remind you that this is the lived experience of a lot of people. Mm. And you know, it, you know, okay, it might be actors at some points or you know, semi-documentary, but it is the lived experience. It's based on the lived experience of other people, and just like Dickens, it should inform our idea of what it means to be um, living in poverty. You know, and there are different elements of what poverty is. You know, it, poverty, like you know, society changes. Uh, and in how we need to tackle poverty at, at many different levels, whether it be social poverty or economic poverty. You know, you could be impoverished through the fact that you have lack of uh, self-confidence. You know, it can hold you back, especially in communities like mine. You know, you know, I left school at 16, not one single uh, qualification. And if it hadn't been for the social uh, support that I got from family and friends, I, I wouldn't be in a position I was today. But what Roach and Dickens were doing is they are reflecting the lived experience of people in, our, in, in the state. When um, you know Tory MPs are saying, you know, this isn't accurate; it's just a story. You, you know, you've just made it up. Um, is it? Are they not receiving any casework in terms of? Um, you know, universal credit and the impact and disability cuts, etc. Are they not receiving you know, that? You've got to remember, work? Corey. I mean, as you you will remember, there's some MPs who don't even even use email. So you know, or even hold a surgery. An MP is under no obligation to hold a surgery. An MP is under no obligation to use email. Um, there are some MPs who will not get this type of evidence through their door, like me or others of all political parties. And you will find people in the Conservative Party, um, I think it was Heidi Allen was quite vocal about universal credit and its impact, um, who do have that experience. But a lot of these constituency MPs who are very vocal about supportive also live in communities which are very economically and socially wealthy. You know, wealth is not just an economic element, it's a social element. Everybody's very confident, you know, people have money to support to pay their mortgage, they might even have bought their house completely, you know. Um, so it's, 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 they, they just don't get it. Have you seen the film, Ellen? Do you feel it's, you know, some people are out of touch with the reality? I haven't seen the film, but I think one of the things that we're talking about here, this saying that it is a story, mm -hmm. If you can't empathise because you only see it as a story, you need to look at whom it's reflecting with, yeah. whom it's resonating with, and that is the actual important thing. There's a lot of stories that might not be true in the truest sense. They are not you know, autobiographies, but the people that it resonates with and to the, the level to which it resonates, that's what should tell you what is going on in the country. Another um, story this week was we saw Alex Salmond winning his case against the Scottish Government, um, but it seems to have left more questions than answers um, and also you know while we can't comment on an ongoing police investigation the process so far has been less than satisfactory um, both for Alec and obviously the alleged victims um, we've been talking about leaks to the papers where victims coached that was this a smear campaign what is the outcome of this? Where does it leave us? You know, there's still a prosecution case. What's going to happen there? Mm. And obviously Nicola Sturgeon has been criticised for her stance. Um, was Leslie Evans' apology enough, do you think? It's really, I mean, for me, on a personal level, it's difficult because, you know, Alec led the party for so long, um, gave us a, an independence referendum, and you... You know, it is difficult in, in, in getting around your head about where we're at with this situation. And, you know, having worked with a whole range of civil servants, having been in local government, this is actually 
my old council ward where I was a, a bailey in the city of Glasgow. You know, you know civil servants need to make decisions. And um, was it enough? Um, mm, it's a difficult one. And given the fact that there are ongoing uh, investigations, I think it'd be very. I think it's very difficult for MD to get their head around it, given the fact that there are, there's more than one person involved. In mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, you know, Alec has been quite clear about the reason he went to court. The judgment that she was given was very clear. And I think there needs to be a lot of hard thinking in St Andrew's house about how it got to this mm -hmm. position. And that's not because Alex Salmond was um, you know, formerly a First Minister or a leader of the Scottish National Party, but in terms of the people who've made the allegations and how they now see themselves, or anyone in the civil service, about getting access to a, a fair hearing. Mm -hmm. And also the element that, you know, the leak. Now, that, that should challenge everyone in politics, not just the SNP. And, you know, and if anyone has to have a go, based on the premises, just having a go at Alec and the SNP or the, the First Minister, they should really think about the consequences of a leak which brought this around where people making these types of allegations and those who will come after them uh, will not have confidence in the system. Yeah, because it, it feels a bit like sometimes it's jury by media, really, Ellen. Have you been following this? I have been case? following this. I think that is a very double-edged blade, though, mm -hmm. because I believe that Alec has been using the same tools for his side and fighting fighting his side of that um, argument. Um, so we cannot chastise just one side of it. Yeah. Of course, it's not fair to be attacked in the way that he has been and to have it in such a mudslinging match is, is never going to be easy. But um, every yeah. side has to stick mm -hmm. to a, a, an inner level of integrity. And I think mm -hmm. that path has not been treaded carefully enough on either side, if yeah. I'm honest. I would just maybe add one thing as well, that you know, everyone's innocent until proven guilty, yes. and that is the rule of law. And, and I have said that even to members of other political parties in the Commons around the activities. There was a Tory MP who was found not guilty of electoral fraud uh, only in the last week, I think it was. And so these issues around a judgment prior um, to either conviction or innocence being proven are very difficult and, and I think we should all be mindful that the rule of law underpins li liberal democracy, whether you be Alec, whether you be the person who's made the allegations. And that's why the issue of a leak somewhere um, should be a profound uh, concern to everybody. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the Scottish Government this time, um, it looks like we're a step closer to um, the teachers taking a ballot on strike action. Um, as I understand it, John Swinney has made an enhanced offer on Thursday of 9% over the next three years. Um, does the Scottish Government seem to be trying to find a solution, given the difficult financial climate of Brexit and uncertainty? I think we're moving towards it but the teachers have good reasons to be upset when their wages are not keeping up with inflation and are, are actually de facto detrimentally affected by that not taking place. Mm -hmm. I can understand why it would be difficult. Yeah. And that, um, as a, an undercurrent appeared on social media where um, there's a suggestion that unions are using this and other recent disputes um, and strikes for their own agenda. The agenda of a trade union is to represent their members. And if the members are articulating a position, then they have every right to do so. And I'll be quite clear that, you know, every trade union in Scotland has the right to strike. You know, there should be no idea that they don't. And I, I, I hope that the, the new kind of proposal from the, from the Deputy First Minister will go some way to, um, you know, alleviating concern around pay. But I think you put it in its context when you did the introduction to it about Brexit. And if we think this is difficult, come the 29th of March, the economic case for the UK will be deeply undermined and that will impact teachers, nurses, um, ancillary staff, um, someone working in the local graveyard in the, in the, in the borough, as I would say. Uh, it will undermine financial markets in the finance sector based in Glasgow and Edinburgh, the oil industry in Scotland. So there are huge concerns about where we, how we understand the context of this. But we need to be clear that 
every trade union has the right to strike if they think their members wish that view to be articulated. But hopefully the, the, the Deputy First Minister is offerable will come, go some way to you know, bridging the gap. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another story um, in the news this week was the, the Saudi teenager um, Rahaf Mohammed um, who escaped her family on a trip to Kuwait um, and obviously she renounced Islam which is punishable by death mm -hmm. um, back in our home, our home country. This sparked a debate um, on the Saudi Arabia's guardianship rules where all women must have a male appointed as a guardian. Um, What's your thoughts on what that terrifying, well, it seems like a terrifying ordeal that that young girl must have been going through? Absolutely, and considering that as a teenager you're, you're completely reliant on your family, this is, this is what we all come up from and what follows that is adulthood. To have to make these decisions without the backup of any of your family members, to be so terrified in your life that this is the decision that you take, it's... it's I think it's nearly unspeakable and this is one of the reasons why asylum should be granted, why people become yeah. refugees from mm. their own home mm. countries, from their own situations. It is important to listen and it's important to understand. And it was good to see that obviously she got asylum in Canada, um, but is it no surprise that the UK didn't step in to help? Well, let me just say, don't you just love Canada? That's why I've got a lumberjack shirt on today. <laughs> you know, I just love Canada. Um, Dora got a lot of family in Canada, and it was of no surprise to me that uh, Canada stepped up to the plate while we in the UK, yeah, again, you know, completely diverted by Brexit. You know, it's fundamentally undermining the support system within the Foreign Commonwealth Office around consular um, support. I mean, I, I'm sure I could go on for some time about my constituent, Jagtar Singh Johal, who is being held in India without charge now for over a year and that's a UK citizen, it's a, a young lad for Dumbarton and you know I, I think you know this Canada stepping up to the plate reminds the world that you know you know it can be done but it's just also in the concept of what she has been through as a young person and her notion of what is um, what is normal and in Saudi Arabia this is normal and it's how do you tackle that uh, that, that competing ideology of what is normal uh, and how difficult that will be in, you know, in the years, the decades ahead. You know, the Middle East will become a major powerhouse in terms of economics and finance and IT and digitization. And Saudi Arabia is really heavily investing in that. Uh, and they are, it's like China, you know, it's like the People's Republic of China, you know, that communist idea of, um, well, even an idea of communism. Uh, th their new normal, what is normal for us is certainly not normal in Riyadh or in Beijing and whether you know you are R R Rafa or you're someone coming from somewhere else which is not in the West, you know, uh, things like the internet are giving you an idea of life is different in other places mm -hmm. and it's going to be a big challenge for all of us but delighted and uh, just love Canada. <laughs> yeah. Obviously the um Saudi Arabia doesn't have a great human rights track record. Um, as Martin just touched on there, how do we tackle that going forward from a global aspect? I mean, do, is it that we shouldn't be interfering in other countries' business or should we be working and challenging them when we are, you know, trying to make a, a difference? I think that's an excellent question. I think it's actually fairly simple. We cannot interfere in other people's countries in the way that the West has liked to do in, in recent history and not so recent history but what we can do is listen to the people that want to come out of it and we can support them and we can embrace them and we can empower them. These are the people that will shine their light back home mm -hmm. and nobody in this world by now is disconnected enough anymore to not see those lights shining from all across the globe which is why it's important. So do you think um, like young women back in Saudi Arabia will know about that young girl's story and you know I, I suppose maybe it might be through um, social media or whatever but you know is, is she going to be um, a kind of role model for? Absolutely and I think that is something that comes with being with being removed from mm. the context that should have given you your safety your family uh, you go out into the world and you have to find yourself and you have to find something to stand for the way that people that exit their own safe spaces that aren't safe often go about this is by becoming advocates and speaking about their lives. It's a good form of therapy and a cathartic way of dealing with these things and 
I can see that happening very easily. It wouldn't be the first time. It's not the first national of a country that whistleblows once they get abroad and just shines their light onto issues that are quite happily brushed under the carpet until somebody doesn't allow it to. Mm -hmm. You can't imagine Theresa May having many conversations with the Saudis about their human rights. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a difficult one. And it, it's not difficult. I mean, you go back to when Robin Cook, um, the previous Labour Foreign Secretary, tried to have an ethical foreign policy, and that kind of just really blew up in their face. I mean, you know, we live in a very complex world, mm. and how you engage, you have to engage with people. If you're not engaging even with some of the worst tyrants in the world, you're not making inroads for change. And we don't stand, you know, the world does not stand still because it's either their way or our way. And, and I should, certainly don't want to live under communist Chinese rule or a, a Saudi idea of how we live as well. And I look at countries like Ireland uh, and also Denmark. Uh, I look at how Ireland plays a major part in peacekeeping through the UN, it is the major contributor to peacekeeping forces. They lose lives and, you know, uh, you know they, they, they invest in peace. And it's a word we don't use a lot these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and just you know, talking about women's rights, especially in this type of context, and I was reading in uh, The New Yorker uh, during the week, um, and there's an article by a guy called Ben Taub, and it was about the women of Iraq, whose either their ex-husbands um, or their husbands joined Daesh, but had left their wives. And these women were now being painted with the same brush. And uh, it, you know you can go online and read it. It, it is just uh, terrifying about the lives that they are now leading in these detention camps all over Iraq. How they are treated, raped, brutalised, and how their children are brutalised when it's got nothing to do with them. And what we're doing there, and this is where if we don't have a consistency in terms of foreign policy and, and engagement, is we are now stoking up the next intifada in Iraq. And you know that will have consequences for us all. So these things are all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's about power relationships for me. How these women are being treated in Iraq because no one wants to talk about it. People in the West don't want to talk about it because they think they're linked to Daesh. Um, and these kids who are, are living in just utter, utter squalor in the 21st century. Yeah, you're inheriting your father's sins on the yes. one hand. But yeah. when we're talking about human rights, it's, it's all too easy to point the finger abroad. Yep. The UK mm -hmm. is in violation of several human rights, mm -hmm. both through Brexit and outside of that whole yep. topic. And it's very, it's very important that we have our finger on that, that we are aware that it's, you know, it's not an other people issue, mm. all of us. It's all of us, yep. Fair I think that was um, highlighted recently in the, the UN poverty report, mm. which actually Absolutely. said the government were in violation of human rights um, because people are in poverty and dying mm -hmm. um, yes. as a result of the austerity policies of, of, of their the policies, of their decisions, yeah. yeah, and MPs walking through the lobbies to vote for it. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. such a, it's it's not just one issue, there's a, a breadth of issue that when it comes to human rights, I think lots of people haven't read the, chi the, the Charter of Human Rights, it's one of the most beautiful documents that you could ever engage with, and if you understand, for us EU nationals, it's having a democratic right removed mm -hmm. that we have already been granted that goes against human rights. There's a multitude of violations against human rights that people aren't even aware of because they don't know their rights. Mm -hmm. But do you think, um, I mean, for the last few years there's been this narrative about human rights as if it's like, oh, I've just got too many rights and the, 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 the media has kind of turned it into a negative, do you know what I mean? It's like, um, it's not portrayed as a, a good, positive thing. And in some ways that's kind of how we've reached Brexit because it's this like you know they're they're telling us what to do and they've eroded you know eroded our human rights and all this kind of yeah. stuff. It has been it's been a sort of negative portrayal. It's really weird because I think when you saw during the independence referendum we discussed our place in the world for two years leading up to uh, 2014, and you know, it came as no surprise to me that we voted as a nation to remain within the European Union because we had. We'd been promised our place, and whereas England had like six months to really look at its position um, in the world in the context of Brexit. And then you look at every other European Union nation state, and the idea that you would leave the EU now in terms of opinion polling, you know, it's like, are you kidding? You know, it defends uh, our liberties, our dignities, uh, and our ability to have a, a good working life. And what's been really for the right wing, specifically, I think, in some parts of the, the British establishment, is to see human rights as something that's not worth fighting for. 
and that peace is an easy hit mm -hmm. and you can get something out of it. And what the establishment in the UK did not do, specifically through Westminster, is defend the process of what it means to be an EU citizen. Mm -hmm. But more or less, uh, also, we, we did stuff that we didn't need to do. You know, France and other countries, uh, Spain would say, well, we're not implementing that directive, you know, because it might undermine certain elements of our own local production. And I've heard Labour MP after Labour MP saying to me privately, do you know, this is our own fault, you know, whether it be the Home Office, whether it be the Department of Trade, implementing all these directives as though, you know, we don't actually care, we'll just do it because it means we don't need to do any of that work. You know, that's why we had so many departments, you know, with utterly incapable of doing trade agreements now. Yeah. You know, so human rights are an essential element about where we want to go as a social democracy um, and, and how we can maintain the, 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 the liberties and nice dignities that we have. You know, we've come a long way since 1945. We um, have, and but no, no country has reached that goal yeah. yet. There is no place in the world that is, you know, that covers all these rights. Yeah. Um, so there's a long way to go. It's yeah. a very ambitious document still, and I think mm -hmm. it will continue to be until we set new goals, yeah. and those can only be set once we've reached these. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think the, the man in the street is really not aware, given the narrative of the protections that being part of the EU has afforded us. Absolutely. I mean, the the level of disinformation. As somebody who comes from a European news environment, lots of the TV channels that my parents watch, that when I watch when I go home and that I now consume online in order to get any proper international and European coverage, it's it's a whole different ball game. There may be some local news, but it is it is much more about understanding how the overall concepts work. Mm -hmm. Much more about that than it is about having you know a snazzy ha headline. It's that's it's not a way to control the media, and it's not about controlling the media in order to suppress, but in order to allow it to flourish in a way that is productive for society. At the minute, most media outlets are catching up with the needs, emotional needs of the consumers, but we're, we're not supposed to be consumers, we're supposed to be participants. It seems strange that actually the world has got a smaller place in terms of social media and I've been able to access people all over the world and getting information that we, we never got before. But here we have the UK almost isolating itself from the rest of the world. I, mean, I, I see the world in a different light, maybe it's just me. Um, I was at the Rotary Club, uh, the Rotary Club in Clydebank yesterday, and we were just talking about um, business and, and and also about the communities in which we all come from in Clydebank. And I was talking about how wherever you would go in the world, when I was um, being a student or you know travelling to family in Canada, you would bump into folk from Clydebank or Dumbarton or the Vale. And you know there are a lot of Scots out there, and we used to live in a more connected, in a sense, you know, through industry and commerce. Um, a lot of that industry and commerce was not very good, you know, it, you know, it, there's, there's a very problematic history to it. But I think through social media, uh, we need to be very careful that we don't, I hate this expression, silo ourselves mm -hmm. from those who have an opposing opinion. And if we do, then we're really losing the concept of what it is to have a community around you. And I, I find that very dif difficult. But the thing about Brexit for me is, is that it's, it's, I suppose it's really, for me, secured the future of the EU. You know, it said to the rest of the European Union, do you know what? Good luck to them. We'll try our best to help them. But, you know, it's really secured in the, the minds of citizens of the individual states within the European Union about what the EU is and what it can be. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a great opportunity for them just to rattle on with what they want to do in, in different ways, whether it be, you know, a more federal system, whether it be more a uh, confederal. You know, I was always a, a more kind of confederal person. I still always agree with Winnie Ewing on that. Uh, and it's a challenge to get your head around what it means to be living in a new type of world. Um, but it's the same world. Mm -hmm. It's just evolving. Yeah. You know, it should come as no surprise. Just picking up on the, the silo point, I mean, how... Obviously, you know, in terms of social media, the, the, there seems to be this way now that you either are talking to people that support and believe the same things you do because the alternative is that if you're having conversations with people who don't it just seems to end up in a kind of horrible aggressive type yeah. um, concept and that that sort of thing about respecting people's views and debate and doesn't seem to extend to social media I mean I think obviously you would have conversations on social media that you absolutely wouldn't have face to face because it wouldn't be acceptable to talk to people like that. So how how do we open up 
that debate to get that sense of community back and it's okay for you not to believe the same things I do mm. and I respect your opinion. We, we seem to have lost that respect. Well, you know, I, I, so you say about people believing the same thing, no one believes the same as me. Mm. You know, we, we are in a sense, uh, we, the individual idea about what we think is our decisions. Um, we have elements of our beliefs that we share and I, I think that's what people should really consider mm -hmm. and come off social media every now and then, just put it down, mm. you know? Mm. Um, you know, read a book, you know, go for a walk and, you know, go and talk to your neighbours, you know, knock somebody next door who's been isolated for a, a couple of years, you know, get out of the bubble because you're not doing yourself any good. And remember, not everyone actually, we, we, we only believe in what we believe in uh, and, and it's how you, try and create a community around a set of beliefs. And that's where it comes back to what I was talking about in terms of the human and human rights. And I, I, I think for us, since, it, since 1949 when it was created, but especially since 1945, whether it be you know, Germany regrowing um, as, a, as a nation state, whether it be the UK or France, you know, building the foundations to keep peace in Europe. And that's what it's achieved, but that's been based on human rights. But I think the other side of that is that there's a generation out there, um, and I'm not including you oh, and I, me. Martin. No, um, Ellen, yes. In, in this, um, <laughs> that, that don't know a life before mobile phones and internet and access to information. And, you know, how often do you see young people just continually walking about like this and they've not done that connection thing or, or, or know a world that, that you didn't have a mobile phone in your back pocket, is that a positive or a minus, do you think? I think it's a new tool and mm. however you use tools, you will have to get accustomed to mm. how you use these tools. I think you're absolutely right. It's important to get out of the bubble every now and then and to have actual real life conversations. But remember that for the people that have grown up having this form of mm. communication as part of their native communication history, this is a way of engaging. This is a communication. We don't make a difference between how that works out. At that point, we need to start understanding how to engage with people again and how can we do that in a digital forum. Maybe this younger generation is better placed to do exactly that. Maybe they are better able to understand that one of the things to do is not to make statements and definite statements and pose statements against one another, but to ask questions to understand the other point of view. I also think there's a lot to be said for saying, look, everybody's entitled to an opinion, but only if it is an informed opinion. And if it isn't informed, then let me give you additional information mm. that you can consider. We have to start not shying away from difficult conversations and politics is often excluded, especially in the UK. In Germany, it is much more normal to speak about politics and to be expected to have quite a high level of understanding. And if you don't, people will laugh you out of the room. Might not be nice, but it keeps the level of conversation up. Mm -hmm. It does. I mean, I would just add that, you know, maybe it does reflect the reality for a lot of young people in terms that they're engaging, they're actually engaging with people in very different ways. And I think when you go to school these days, you see a lot more confident young people. Hmm. And yeah, maybe when they do come out of the playground, they've got their iPad or their phone, and yeah, they're kind of having social media interaction. Uh, it's about, are you going to the fit by the night? Are you going to the hockey? Are, are you going down to the library? You know, or, or could be, are you going down to the, you know, doing the knowledge to hang about, you know? Um, and I think for the older generation, it has been a real challenge because they're now in seeing a more the, the reality of the world is actually far more diverse than they could ever imagine. People think in very different ways, you know, and, and maybe, you know, that is the part that social media does do. It gives us a real idea that people can be fascists. Mm -hmm. They can be, you know, extreme communists. Um, you know, they can make derogatory misogyny or, you know, homophobic um, bigotry. You know, that does exist. And that comes again back to the point about Helms making it Helms like making it on about the, the UN Charter and, and how we need to make sure that undermines how we think about ourselves. You know, you, you can have a, a, an idea about, a, you know, you can have a principled decision, but, you know, some of these just need to be challenged. Mm. And most people, when challenged, change their mind. Interesting, you, you picked up the point that you, you find young people more confident um, nowadays, because the flip side of that is that um, mental health issues in young people seems to have been, seems to have gone through the roof. Is that just because we are more aware of that now? Was that always the case, do you think? Or 
or does you know life in general for young people is it is it more stressful given social media and there's lots of pressures out there and um, there's lots of comparisons I think to other people's lives that potentially are maybe more better than mm. yours but that's just your perception do you think that's in the mix there it's a difficult one um, I, I can only reflect on my own experience you know um, along with my brother and sister I was a carer from the age of 10 uh, for my younger brother uh, left school with no formal qualifications um, and a lot of your life was taken up by things that most other young folk mm. don't do and you know the, the element of social and economic poverty can compound mm. um, any other element of bad. We all talk about mental health. We've all got mental health, you know, and you know whether it's you know on the scale of being bad or good, you know these elements can compound it about being on you know, very negative elements of social media. And I think we just need to be very cautious of, of a lot of other elements underneath that about the social relationships that a young person might be having, whether they're reflected on social media or out, you know, anywhere else in the world. And I think it's far more complex than just a, a black and white answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a very complex issue and I think, uh, like many complex issues, there, there are multiple answers to answer it. Mm -hmm. One of the answers to this is that young people are still in search of their community. We have now access to everything. We know what's going yeah. on in everybody's lives, even the, the issue of having different opinions online. There's, there's people that you would never, whose opinion you would never have found out about if it wasn't for the fact that you now have them on social media. Yeah. And maybe that ignorance can be bliss. Maybe there is something that is overwhelming about knowing every, everybody mm -hmm. and what they're up to, their opinions and where you stand with that. Young people have a right to not understand that yet. You become an adult once you understand whom you are, mm -hmm. like whom you want to be and who you stand for, and what you stand for. And in the process of finding that community, as much as social media is detrimental, it is as much the answer because people now have the opportunity to find communities that they otherwise might never have found. Mm -hmm. So it's more about enabling people and giving them the confidence. And I think you're right, there's a lot of confidence. Um, in younger people, giving them the confidence to take the time. You don't have to be perfect yet. Yep. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to understand who you are yet. And actually, I wish somebody had told me this when I was younger, <laughs> but all adults are not really adults. Nobody seems to have a plan. Everybody's still continuously yep. evolving. That is something that's really missing. I wish more people would say it. Yep. It would have saved me about 12 years of time in self-doubt. <laughs> self um, moving on just briefly to um, local authorities, um, including Highlands and Aberdeen and, and Edinburgh, they're looking at the idea of a tourism tax um, to counteract some of the cuts um, that they've had. I'm kind of trying to work out the implications of that. Do you think um, that, that tourists will go elsewhere if they, they find out an area's you know, putting a tourist tax on? No. Well, most areas put a tourist tax yeah. on, you know, no matter where you go. And it's a smart thing to do. Tourism should benefit the areas that benefit from tourism in other ways. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's also a minimal thing. It's not about taxing people out of, you know, out of their holidays. Yeah. If people want to come to Scotland, they will come to Scotland if it's two or three or five quid more than they thought. It, it, it's the difference between having another coffee and not having another coffee. Nobody's going to be put yeah. off by it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, only, the only thing I, I would say is, and yeah, definitely go for it, uh, try it out, is that what if you, you know, you're in a, a community in which people will travel through and therefore it creates a lot of congestion. And if you're travelling from Glasgow, say, and you'll end up in the A82 and you'll travel directly through West Dunbartonshire, you know, up through the back of Clydebank, down through the back of Dunbarton, up the, in the side of the Vale of Leaven. And we've got a million and a half people using that road every, every year, we think the stats are. Uh, and, you know, how do we, uh, you know, if, if people are going to use it West Dunbartonshire, that'd be great, but if you're going to Argyleshire or the rest of the Highlands, um, you know, we are taking some of the hit in terms of infrastructure. So I think it's a, there is an interesting process, an interesting step, and it would just be interesting to see how it impacts wider infrastructure investment. Mm. How, how does the distribution of the money work that yeah. is getting raised? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, folks, that's all we've got time for. No. Yeah, that's just... I wanted to talk about Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> that's just flown in. Um, 
So that's it for this week's Full Scottish. Um, thanks to Martin and Ellen. I've got your own way around there, Martin and Ellen, <laughs> <laughs> for joining us. And thanks to you at home for watching. You can visit us on our website, um, broadcastingscotland.scot, where you can subscribe for just £5 a month. Um, and do join us again next Sunday for the Full Scottish.